Hi. That was a very warm welcome. Thank you. I suspect it was more for him than me, but that's all right. <laughs> Beto O'Rourke, welcome back to Chicago. I know you've spent some time here. Thank you. And Brandis, thanks for doing this. And to each of you for, for coming out and to Michael and Chicago Humanities for inviting us to be with you today. I was lucky enough to bring my son, Henry, 12 years old with me. So we're spending the weekend in sunny Chicago. And um, so really, so far, so good. We're, we're excited to see the museums, to go to the lakefront, to um, just, just be in one of the greatest cities on the planet and to be part of this festival is, is such, an, such an honor. I um, spent 10 weeks as a Pritzker Fellow with the University of Chicago's Institute of Politics. That started in February and lasted till just a couple of weeks ago. Incredible experience, um, extraordinarily bright young people, obviously at the University of Chicago, but what, what really got me and what I've shared with my friends and my wife about why this experience has been so special is that these young people are so hopeful and optimistic about our future. And they're not waiting on the sidelines to see it come to pass. They're taking the action, they have the urgency, um, they're doing the work. And that's the kind of energy that I want in my life right now and I think that we need in this country. So really excited about what's happening in Chicago these days. And I also learned in the green room, your wife has a connection to Chicago that a lot of us, I don't think, knew about. Yeah, so my wife Amy uh, was born and raised till the age of eight or nine here in Chicago in Hyde Park, went to the lab school, uh, moved to New Mexico, um, and then uh, after college, she was teaching in Guatemala, was coming back through El Paso. We got set up on a blind date, and like any good El Paso kid, uh, I took her on our blind date to... Uh, the Kentucky Club in Ciudad Juarez, which is where they invented the margarita. And we had an amazing first date, and just good things uh, came from that, including Henry. It's all worked out for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the book. You wrote this during the gubernatorial campaign? I really wrote almost all of it before the gubernatorial campaign in, in 2000. 20 and 2021, but edited it when we were on the road during the campaign. Was that was, a good idea? You no, know, at, at the time, it didn't really feel like it. You know, in order to keep this schedule that Michael was just talking about, going to these 254 counties and having these town halls all over the state of Texas and really taking on what most thought to be a pretty close to impossible fight. You know, you're, you're burning at both ends every hour of the day. And so to find time, you just got to wake up a little bit earlier or go to bed a little bit later. But this book was so important to me because you know, the race for governor, the race for Senate, my time in public office as a member of Congress, just the work that we're doing now as volunteers is about making sure that this country comes through against the greatest concerted attack on the right to vote in our democracy that any of us, no matter how old you are, have seen during our lifetimes. And we have to give this everything that we've got. And for me, this book is part of giving it everything that I've got. So I was, I was ultimately really glad that we did this, been very happy with the reception to the book, and hope that as people read it and as we elevate the stories of those who fought these same fights before any of us were, were ever born, we can take that inspiration and example and put it to use right now. So one of the characters who fought that fight um, that you introduce us to in the book, and then we you know, follow him through the book a little bit uh, as well, is Dr. Lawrence Nixon. Tell us about him. This guy is amazing, and I don't know how many of you have heard the name Lawrence Nixon before. Um, though he was an El Pasoan, and I was born and raised in El Paso, went to elementary and middle and much of high school in El Paso, never heard his name until well into my adult life. Um, this guy was born in the 19th century to a man who himself had been enslaved. Uh, grew up in Marshall, Texas, which uh, for those unfamiliar with Texas geography is in the upper northeast part of the state, you know, very close to Arkansas. Uh, a bastion in the Confederacy, uh, an administrative headquarters during the Civil War for the Confederacy. And after the Civil War, certainly a hot spot of white nationalism. Um, he goes to Wiley College, one of the great historically black universities that's still in Marshall, Texas. Um, graduates, goes to medical school, 
in Tennessee at an all-black medical school, um, comes to work in Texas, and he goes to a city called Cameron, Texas. And he's practicing there for a couple of years when he is witness to a lynching of another black man in that community. And he realizes at that point that he's got to get out of Cameron and moves to the furthest western community in the state of Texas, my hometown of El Paso, which, again, for those of you unfamiliar with our geography, is on the border of Mexico and New Mexico. It's in the Chihuahuan Desert. It's in the Rocky Mountains. It's a base elevation of 4,000 feet. It is as unlike the rest of Texas as you can get and still be in the state of Texas. It is, I think, in part because of its binational character, just inherently a little bit more tolerant of people who do not look like the majority in the United States. That's true today, and I think it was true back then as well. He flourishes in El Paso. 1914, he starts the first chapter of the NAACP in the state of Texas in El Paso. He participates in every election. He's as civically engaged as a human being could be at that time, especially if he were black in a state of the former Confederacy. Well, in 1923, 100 years ago, almost to the day, the Texas state legislature passes what is known as the white primary law. And what the white primary law did effectively was ban all African Americans and pretty soon many Mexican Americans and anyone who was not quote unquote white in the state of Texas from participating in our politics, from voting for those running for office, for running for office themselves. And to be clear, this was not how many bubbles are in this bar of soap, how many jelly beans in this jar, can you pass this literacy test, can you quote from the state constitution in black and white, in state code, it said if you were black, you were not going to vote in the state of Texas. So nonetheless, in 1924, the next year, this is the year that you have the big congressional and gubernatorial elections in the state of Texas, Dr. Lawrence Nixon pays his poll tax, goes to his normal voting location, fire station number five on Texas Avenue near downtown El Paso, waits in line, gets to the front of the line where he's recognized by the election judges because this guy's never missed an election in his life as long as he's lived in El Paso. And they say to him, Dr. Nixon, you know we can't let you vote. And Nixon says, I know you can't, but I've got to try. And he takes a case to the local district court, loses, appeals, ultimately makes it all the way to the United States Supreme Court in 1927, This guy's had to wait three years to get this case heard and decided, wins the case. The Texas legislature then changes the law to get under the ruling. Lawrence Nixon goes back to the Supreme Court again, wins a second signal Supreme Court victory. This is now in the 1930s. The Texas Democratic Party, which was the only party in power in Texas at the time, and the state legislature again circumvent the Supreme Court ruling And it's not until 1944, 21 years after he begun this fight, that you finally have the integration of Texas elections, at least partially, through another Supreme Court decision, Smith versus Allwright. So this guy, Lawrence Nixon, is an absolute all-time hero in my mind, a national treasure for this country, and is one of the few people who did so much, who so many of us have heard so little about, who needs the recognition and the elevation. So I put him front and center in this book. And one last thing, maybe a coda to this story. We begin the book by talking about every manner of depredation and brutality and violence in Texas prior to Lawrence Nixon's fight. Um, Ballot boxes literally being stolen, people being murdered and lynched for trying to participate in their own democracy. Texas has been the epicenter of the worst crimes committed against this great democracy that we are justifiably so proud of. But Texas has also produced the heroes who overcome these challenges. Lawrence Nixon is one of them, but Lawrence Nixon's fight that I just described laid the path for another. Lyndon Baines Johnson, 20 years later, the first Texas president, writes into law the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which creates the first true multiracial democracy in American history. That moment is impossible 
without first the sacrifice, the struggle, and the service of Dr. Lawrence Nixon and so many like him. And these are the people who populate this book, We've Got to Try. You and I, we had the chance to talk a little bit earlier this week. Um, and, you know, you, you talk about the, you know, the failure that ended up being Reconstruction um, when at the time black people were allowed to vote and then all that had to happen until 1964 um, with the passage of the Voting Rights Act. Um, and one of your concerns is sort of timing with looking at where we are today with the encroachment of, of voting rights restrictions um, and how long before there's another way to check some of the restrictions that, that have not just popped up but that have been implemented since the Shelby County case. That's right. We're, we're in, a, in a moment unlike any other in our lifetime, but not unlike any other in the lifetime of this country. And that's really the research I did in this book and, and the stories that we try to bring to life, um, I hope, illustrate. And you know that saying that you know, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. You, you certainly hear and see the rhythm of American history and this democracy that is not a straight line and is not always perpetually making progress. And a realization and a truth that I found in writing this book and certainly being alive in America in 2023, which is that no victory is permanent. This fight will continue forever. You thought that we decided reproductive health care access in 1973. You could wash your hands of it and move on. You were wrong. You thought we decided democracy in 1965. Well, the Shelby decision in 2013 proved us all wrong to that. And if you needed an exclamation point, it was the 6th of January, 2021. And that slow rolling insurrection, which unfortunately is alive and well throughout the United States of America today. Look at Texas, which since January 6, 2021, has imposed the most onerous restrictions on the right to vote and to register anywhere in the United States of America. It is harder to cast a ballot in my home state than any other place in the United States today. But this isn't a historical. This didn't just come out of, of nowhere. This is not Donald Trump. This is not MAGA. This is not anything new to any of us. They are all certainly aiding and abetting. But this is core and fundamental to the American character. Right after Reconstruction in Texas, in counties like Fort Bend, half of the elected officials are still African-American. Uh, in fact, the first sheriff who's black, who's ever elected to that office anywhere in this country, was elected in Fort Bend in, I think, 1867. But that was too much for the white nationalists in that community in the 1880s. And so they started this gang, this white nationalist gang, maybe the precursors to the Proud Boys, that were called the Jaybirds. The Jaybirds were an armed militia, and they began to not peacefully and democratically and nonviolently decide the outcome of these elections, but literally through the barrel of a gun, take and fight for and kill people for political power in the state. The governor of Texas at the time, Sol Ross, rode in to the rescue, quote unquote, at the time, and made a peace that was essentially a desert for democracy in Texas. Every single black office holder was ejected from office in Fort Bend County. This election outrage was not lost on the rest of the country. The story makes it up to the United States Congress where, check this out because here's another rhyme for you. The pro-democracy party at the time, they happened to be the Republicans in the 1880s and the 1890s, take up a federal elections bill to try to correct these injustices in Texas and Mississippi, where you're from, in the states of the former Confederacy. The pro-democracy Republicans have a majority in the House, they have a majority in the Senate, and there's a pro-democracy Republican, Benjamin Harrison, who ran for the presidency on a platform of restoring voting rights to the African Americans who've had them stripped since the end of Reconstruction. Well, this federal elections bill in 1890 passes the House, is about to pass the Senate, but is hung up on the horns of a filibuster led by a senator from the state of Texas, no less. And the Republicans, though they have a majority to override this filibuster or to change the rules of the Senate, instead turn a blind eye and ultimately their backs on this democracy, on their fellow Americans, and they allow that bill to die. 
1890. It will be 75 years of Jim Crow and the most rank injustice in this country until you get LBJ, thanks to Dr. Lawrence Nixon and the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65. Well, here we are. Think about 2021. We had a pro-democracy party who had the House, they happened to be the Democrats, who had the Senate, and a president who ran on restoring voting rights in the White House. It passes the House, the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Act. Uh, it, it has every possible mathematical possibility of passing the Senate, but is hung up on the threat of a filibuster. And though Democrats have the votes to change the rules in that chamber, they turn a blind eye, they turn their back, and they move on to other business, losing the last best hope we had while Democrats still held unity of power in our federal government. That leaves us where we are today with divided government. No chance this is going to pass the House, but it doesn't allow us to give up. As Nixon showed, 21 years. And imagine the frustration, the ridicule he endured, probably fa family members saying, hey, when are you going to give up? This is Texas. This is America. This is the South. You're never going to get the right to vote. Let's just move on and do other things in our lives. But he persisted. He had the courage of his convictions. And ultimately, he overcame. And he won that. And he got us to where we are today with this example that we must use for a fight that, unfortunately, because we screwed up the best opportunity that we had in 2021, is probably going to be a long one. But if you care about this country, if you care about our democracy, if you care about the right to vote, then it's one that we must wage and one that we must win. And, and one other thing, so this doesn't just sound theoretical or ephemeral or academic when I use the word democracy. Why does Texas right now lead the nation in school shootings? Why is gun violence the number one cause of death for kids and teenagers? Why were five people, including an eight-year-old child, blown away by somebody with an AR-15 in my state just last night? Why is it harder to see a reproductive health care provider in my home state than any other? Why do we lead the developed world in the rate of maternal mortality, especially for black women in Texas right now? Why is the minimum wage $7.25 in Texas? Why are we the least insured state in America, number one in the country for childhood diabetes deaths? Absolutely preventable absolutely unforgivable in my mind. It's not what the people of Texas want. It's what happens when you don't have a democracy. When more than 9 million of my fellow Texans eligible, most of them registered to vote, didn't participate in last year's gubernatorial election, which would have decided every single one of those issues that I just brought up. It's not because they're lazy. It's not a lack of love for this democracy. When you've closed more than 700 polling locations, when you can use your uh, ID to carry a firearm, but you can't use your ID from an institution of higher education to prove who you are at the polling place, when you have a racial gerrymander of our congressional districts, you begin to understand we are something less than a democracy right now. And the consequences are literally killing the people in the state that I love and where I'm raising uh, our kids. And so this is a life and death battle for the life of our country and for the lives of those in our lives right now. One of the things you just mentioned, what, 9 million people in the state of Texas eligible to vote, many of them registered to vote, but not voting. Um, Chicagoans don't experience the same level of um, uh, voter restrictions that Texans are, are experiencing. Early voting is open here for what, like three, four weeks? It's a long time. <laughs> you can vote on a Saturday, on a Sunday. It's, the restrictions are different. That said, in this mayoral election that we just had a few weeks ago, only 38%, and that was high. That was the highest since 1999. We, we fight for voting rights. You fight for voting rights. How do you get people to go vote? Beyond removing restrictions that, that are in the way, and actually there are some brilliant people in Chicago who are pioneering in this, um, setting up polling locations within Cook County jails. Yes. For those who've not been convicted of a crime in a country where you're still innocent until proven guilty, but who have functionally before been denied their right to vote, folks who are knocking on doors, people who are engaging young voters, 18 to 30 years old at the University of Chicago, and I got to meet a lot of them. 
That's really exciting. But you're right, it, it is not sufficient to the task at hand. And it's tough because we've probably never been more isolated from one another, more polarized politically on partisan or geographic or religious or other imaginary boundaries. And we're not having the conversations that revive civic life to the degree that everyone sees that they have a stake in the outcome of these elections. So I mentioned I was doing this wonderful um, fellowship at the University of Chicago, IOP, uh, for about 10 weeks. And every week I flew into O'Hare, and every week I flew out of O'Hare. And every week I took a cab to Hyde Park um, from O'Hare and, and every week back. And so I'd have about 45 minutes to an hour to talk to the cab driver. Every single cab driver I Chicago spoke with traffic. said that they were not voting. And I'd say, well, why aren't you voting? It doesn't matter. Uh, whoever they elect, my life will be the same. Um, the inability to see yourself in the future of your community, in the outcome of an election, to believe, perhaps maybe not incorrectly in many political contests, that those who purchased access to power and often purchase the outcomes of the legislation that those in power promote or sponsor, I don't think it is an irrational conclusion to decide, you know what, I'm just not gonna do this. I've met people in Texas who say, you know, I was drawn out of my congressional district because I'm black, so that I would have less power to decide the outcome of the new district that I've been put in. Fuck that, I'm not voting. And I don't blame the person for doing that. And I've gotten off my high horse and said, listen, if you don't vote, then you get what you deserve, all that crazy stuff. No, th there are people who've experienced, who've, been, who've borne the brunt of suppression and intimidation, who live near Texas Southern University, where in that neighborhood in Houston, the line to vote is six hours. And part of you is like, wow, that's amazing. People wait six hours to vote. Go democracy. But really, the rest of you should be ashamed that we force anybody to wait six hours to be able to freely and fairly choose the person or the people who will represent them in their government. And it's not an accident, it's by design. I mentioned more than 700 polling place closures in Texas, almost all of them concentrated in the fastest growing black and brown neighborhoods in our state. So for every person who's willing and able to wait six hours, how many are working a $7.25 an hour job, which means you're working two or three of those jobs and doesn't have the time, or taking care of your folks or your kids, or don't want to suffer the indignity of waiting in that line? I don't blame them. So we have challenges in Texas for sure. We have challenges in Chicago. The best way to beat them back, I have found, is for us personally to be involved. And that means not through social media, not through television, not through the mail. Maybe those are necessary media in today's political environment. But when one human meets another human, eyeball to eyeball, face to face, when you engage at that person's front door, something absolutely transcendent and profound takes place. That person now sees themselves in you, in this political action that you're asking them to take, in the outcome of that election. It's really hard work. I've knocked on tens of thousands of doors. Across Texas, we held hundreds, probably thousands of town hall meetings in safe democratic places like Austin and El Paso and Houston, but in perhaps unfriendly places for Democrats like Childress or Amarillo or Abilene, so red you can see it glowing from outer space as you orbit <laughs> planet Earth. But the best way to engage people who otherwise are gonna write me off because they probably think that I've written them off as well. And to give those who are laboring in the wilderness, who thinks that nobody has heard their song or knows what they're going through right now, to show up and listen to them and bring them into the conversation. In 2018, when we ran for Senate, we saw the highest voter turnout in Texas in more than 30 years. And it had everything to do with people connecting with people all across the state of Texas. We won more votes than any Democrat since LBJ in 1964, and that happened because of the power of people. So again, not easy. We won't solve this through money or technology. It's gonna be our willingness to engage with our neighbors, including and especially those who disagree with us or those who thought they have dropped out of the process. That's how we bring them back in. You mentioned, you mentioned, um, 
the the folks, for example, who are getting they've established uh, a polling location in Cook County Jail. Chicago Votes is the name of that group, and you know they're led by a bunch of young and very energetic, bright people. Um, they are taking high schoolers to the polls uh, for the Chicago mayoral election, for example. Um, so obviously, you know, getting folks who have typically been disenfranchised, but also especially young people involved. And so I want to hear from you on, you know, how the push to get young people involved is playing out. But also, the GOP is betting on millennials, who aren't that young anymore, um, betting on millennials uh, to, uh, to get more conservative as they age, right, and start coming their way. But I think there's some research that's saying, some research that's saying, that might not happen with that generation. Um, and different generations change as they get older for different reasons, because they're different generations. Um, so what if that doesn't happen? For them, yeah. You know, part of this uh, Pritzker Fellowship um, required that I hold office hours and um, 20 minutes a slot, and you know every slot on Wednesday, uh, thankfully was taken with again extraordinary undergrad and graduate students. And to each of them, I posed this question because I'm 50 now, so I'm I'm no longer you know experiencing um, the answer to this question of how you get young people to vote, but they are. And you know, most of them, they're at the University of Chicago, they're part of the Institute of Politics, they're voting, but I ask, why are your peers not voting? And we talk about the major challenges that this country faces, that the city of Chicago faces right now, and the lack of action or progress being made. And again, the not irrational or illogical conclusion that it just does not matter. And so I'll give you an example. I was asking one of the young men who came in for office hours, about the issue that he wanted to talk about, gun violence. And I said, what do you think it's gonna take for this country to change when it comes to gun violence? And he's 18, 19 years old, and he says, you know, everything that it should take to change this country on gun violence has already happened. You know, he talked about Sandy Hook, he talked about Parkland, he talked about Las Vegas, he talked about Pulse, he talked about Uvalde. It hasn't even been a year since those 19 kids and their two teachers were slaughtered in that classroom in South Texas, so badly mangled, their parents could not identify their bodies except for the shoes that they were wearing. These 18-year-olds are watching us do absolutely nothing. In the state of Texas, in fact, we are making it easier for people who should never possess a firearm to carry one publicly in the wake of that tragedy and that slaughter and you validate. Now, for some people, that's going to energize them, and God bless them, right? But for others, it's a little bit dispiriting, and we can understand the temptation to despair or to give up or just to say, this democracy is not working. And I think that's the most insidious, perverse part of, of all of this, is when those in power keep others from ever achieving power by making it harder to vote or don't move forward on the most pressing issues of the day. It could be gun violence, it could be climate change. There's an election in El Paso right now to, to pass a climate charter written by young people in, in our community. When those in power fail to act, when these young people see their parents voting in election after election, and nothing about the issue they care most about changes, I can understand why some of them give up and don't get involved. In part, this story of Dr. Lawrence Nixon 21 years without even the right to cast a ballot. And that guy never, ever, ever gave up or ever gave in. And through his sacrifice, we now are able to vote. I'm trying to make sure we all understand his story, the story of John Lewis. What was he on March 7th, 1965? 24 years old, 23 years old. Not too much older than some of these young people who are choosing or deciding not to vote in Chicago or El Paso. And through his sacrifice and struggle, he shocks the conscience of the country on Bloody Sunday across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. Eight days later, think about the power that this young 24-year-old had. Eight days after Bloody Sunday, Lyndon Baines Johnson, arguably the most powerful man on the planet, convenes a joint session of Congress. And he asks all those white lawmakers, including from the South, the bastion of the Democratic Party, which he knows he's going to lose, he thinks, for a generation. Um, how wrong he was, right? Many generations would follow that. And he says, look at what John Lewis just did. You know, as it was at Concord in the Revolutionary War, as it was at Appomattox in 1865, so it is again today in America. 
are fellow citizens willing to lay down their lives for this great democracy. And what are you, he asked the members of Congress, going to do about it? By that summer, he's able to sign the Voting Rights Act into law. I want every young person in America to know John Lewis's story. You don't have to be in elected office. You can even be the target of voter suppression, voter intimidation, as you will be if you're young in the state of Texas, as John Lewis was back in 1965. And yet you possess extraordinary power to shape and change the direction that this country takes. So I am betting long on these young people. They do have the urgency of this moment. They understand precisely where this country is. They have the most finely tuned bullshit detector made by God. And they're going to use all of that to make sure that we ultimately come through. So don't give up or sleep on them because they're going to save us at the end of the day. I'm, I'm convinced of it. Let's hope so. Um, we'll pivot to audience Q&A, so get your questions ready, because I know you've got some good ones, probably better than mine, but I have to ask you about this before we shift. Um, you're from El Paso, uh, obviously. Uh, this week, more migrants in Chicago have been, and I'm using the word shipped, even though you're not supposed to do that with humans, um, because they have been sent to Chicago, and I think in the last 10 days, a lot more have arrived. Several hundred have been arriving since uh, August when Governor Greg Abbott in Texas began doing this, and I think the governor of Florida began sending the immigrants who were coming there to other states as well. This week, though, um, it's been especially overwhelming to the Chicago social services system. About 40 were sleeping at the O'Hare Airport this week. Um, others have been sleeping in Chicago police stations this week. Both uh, we at WTTW as well as Black Club Chicago are reporting this. Um, is this just a political stunt that is using humans as game pieces, or should sanctuary cities also share some of the responsibility of, of helping and supporting and caring for migrants when they arrive? First, I, I want to say, you know, with some exceptions, Chicago's done and Illinois has done a phenomenal job of being so warm and so welcoming of strangers in a strange land, people who don't speak the language, who are freaked out, who just completed, before they got to El Paso, a 2,000-mile journey, most of it on foot, some of it atop a train known as La Bestia, the beast, because you don't ride in, you ride on the roof of that train, surviving you know, every threat and depredation that you can cook up. And they finally made it to this amazing country that is itself comprised of people from the planet over. And heartlessly and through political calculation, our governor packs them onto a bus and sends them to Chicago to show you damn liberals just what's happening where we are. And the way you've responded by opening your doors and your hearts and your checkbooks to make sure that they have what they need to do well in this country because their success is our success. They came here to do better for themselves, but in so doing, they will do better for every single one of us. You know that, and it's borne out by the evidence and the facts and the data, but we know it in our hearts as, as Americans. Um, here's what we need, here's what I think we need. You're gonna continue to see Greg Abbott and Ron DeSantis and other people try to score political points by being tough and mean and cruel to immigrants. You know, Donald Trump launching his campaign in 2016, describing those from Mexico as rapists and criminals. Um, you need that language before you're gonna start putting kids in cages and tearing them away literally from their mothers and separating families. Um, it's part of what I think in the minds of some justifies the hundreds of migrants who die every year trying to come in to this country. To replace that, we're gonna need a real solution and we're gonna need leadership and it's gotta come from this president. And thus far, unfortunately, and listen, I voted for Joe Biden. Um, I'm excited about so much of what he's done. And he's done some good things when it comes to immigration, but he's really losing an opportunity to do the right thing here. You mentioned what's going on at O'Hare. Come see the city streets of El Paso, Texas, where these Venezuelan families are sleeping on the sidewalks right now, where the president's team had thought about, thankfully canceled the idea of family separation, or I'm sorry, family detention again, but are going to invoke a transit ban, which means that if you make it that 2,000 miles and you have not first tried 
to claim asylum in Guatemala or Mexico, we bounce you back to Venezuela or to Haiti, the very place from which you fled because you were worried that staying there might cost the life of your daughter or your son or yourself. We cannot be that country, and certainly he cannot be this president. What I'd like to see from my party is a proud embrace of immigration and immigrants as core and fundamental to the success of this country. Let's stop trying to be the lightweight version of Republicans. You know, if they're talking about electrifying fences and alligators and moats at the border, we can't be speaking a Budweiser light version of that. That is, you know, we're going to be tough, but not as mean as those people. And we're going to show you that these immigrants aren't welcome in our communities. And you have to take this very prescriptive approach, or we're going to send you back from the very place that you're fleeing from. I think we need to have paths for those who are seeking asylum, who need refuge in this country, who want to come here and work and do jobs that no one born in America is willing to do for whatever reason at this moment, people who want to join their families that are separated by geography and thousands of miles. I say that we run on this thing, and I know, look, probably the political experts in the room um, would strongly disagree with me. That's probably why you don't hear any Democrat talking about this issue in these ways. But I think this is essential to our character and to our values and to who we are. And if you don't have that leadership from the president, you know what comes into the vacuum and the void? It's Ron DeSantis, it's Greg Abbott, it's this cruelty. Right now in the Texas legislature, they are debating, mark my words, they are likely to pass and the governor will sign into law legislation that will authorize private militias. So any person with an AR-15 can go out and patrol the border. Now, what do you think is going to happen at the end of the day with a policy like that? We are in desperate need of federal leadership at this moment. And I really, truly hope the president will step up and do the right thing. So I'm guessing you all have some questions. Just guessing. Um, Nikki? Has, there are two microphones that are going to be circulating. Good evening, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get our Q&A portion started. Yay, we can see all your faces. <laughs> so please go ahead and raise your hands. We're going to try and keep this brief. I'm sure a lot of you have questions, and we have a very limited amount of time. So please just state your name and ask your question clearly into the microphone, and let's save the stories for later, OK? <laughs> Show of hands. <laughs> and I'll come get you back here. Nikki, I've got one right here. Hi, my name is Danielle, and I'm a Chicago public school teacher. Um, one of my questions is, right now I have sixth through eighth graders, and we talk a lot about getting, you know, those who are of voting age engaged and making sure they register, but how can we do more to tap into middle schoolers and have them track what's going on now so when they can vote, they are ready and they know what's going on. Thanks for the great question and for what you do and for thinking about the solution to this. And we all know the problem. Not enough young people are participating in our elections. What's the answer? The evidence shows that voting is, is a habit. And the earlier we can form this habit, the more comfortable we can make our fellow Americans with the process of casting that ballot, the more likely they are to participate in our elections going forward. So, as it sounds like you're doing, starting in sixth, seventh, eighth grade by taking students to these polling places, which sometimes are at those same middle schools, and having the chance to know how a voting machine works or how you get information to make the kind of decision you need to make in choosing that candidate or voting on a certain proposition, um, that's really important. And we can't pretend that when you turn 18, all that stuff suddenly um, enters your brain and allows you to do the right thing. You may not have been taught that by your parents. Your parents themselves may not have voted. I think this is a great chance for our education system to do the right thing. In Texas, um, it's, it's interesting. By state constitution, high school principals, private and public, are required to make their best effort to register 18-year-olds and 17-year-olds who will be 18 by the next election. 
Um, no surprise to you or me, that law is not enforced um, and is, in fact, they try to dissuade principals from doing that. And if that were not enough, they're now removing polling locations from college campuses. They used to just do it, just do it, at the historically black colleges like Prairie View A&M where they moved the polling location six miles away from a population, most of whom don't have a car. But now they're doing it at Texas A&M, one of the largest universities in the country. They removed the polling location in 2022, and there's a bill pending in the state legislature to move polling locations away from every single college campus and every single high school in the state of Texas. The reason given by the author is she's worried that given how fractious our politics are, we might see violence at these schools, and so she wants to move it away from the, the young people. But you're right on the money. Let's, let's bring more democracy and more voting experience to young people. Thank you. Next question's right over here. Uh, hi, my name is Jacob. Um, and on the other end of it, uh, on being represented, um, even when you do get a candidate and you do get the people that you want in charge, so often the debates end up being so far from what people actually care about. Like I'm thinking about how both, some of two of the biggest issues, like transgender people and abortion rights are both like slam dunk. Uh, in general, it's like 70% where people agree on like, pro-choice and accepting transgender people. And so it feels so, for so many people that politics is so out of touch uh, uh, with what people actually care about. How can we recenter and move away from things that people don't care about or people agree about and onto things that actually affect people? Yeah, uh, so I mentioned Texas and, and the, the disconnect between what we want. No, no one in Texas is good with a $7.25 an hour minimum wage. The vast majority Republicans, Democrats alike, want to raise it. No one's good with us leading the nation in school shootings. I mean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that disconnect can dissuade somebody from participating. I mean, I guess this shit just doesn't work, so why am I gonna vote? What if we could say, you know what, you're right, there's some challenges at the state legislature, and these gerrymandered districts have a real consequence in terms of our ability to choose those who will represent our interests and, and just us. Um, but what about local government, um, county government, which is really powerful in the state of Texas, city government, school boards, which are deciding these issues around critical race theory, and whether we can even discuss Dr. Lawrence Nixon in a high school classroom in the state of Texas. How fucked up is that? That that's a question we have to ask ourselves right now. And yet, that is where we are. These local elections that might have 3,000 people participating in them in some school board districts, that might be a high turnout, um, can be won by going to someone's door and just in the same language you use, talking about the issues that matter most to you. It's an election that you could stand for and win. Um, one of the things that I've shared with, with other young people that I've met at the University of Chicago is there will never be the perfect time to run for office. You'll never have the right amount of money. You'll never be in the right place in your life. You won't have that experience or expertise that you think is just essential. Um, and if you keep waiting, you'll never do it. And what we need is more people like you willing to step out there and run for these offices. And you would be surprised at how much better you can make people's lives from the school board, from the city council, from county government. And in addition, we begin building a bench of political power that can then stand for these higher offices at the state or the federal level. I think that's the best way to do it instead of just being frustrated at where we're not seeing action. Find the places where we can make a difference and get after it. Thanks for asking. And it sounds like Beto O'Rourke just suggested you run for office. Yes, <laughs> I'm with you. Hi, um, my name's Bryant. Uh, we're seeing a lot of, obviously, disenfranchisement with younger voters, but, and we rely on elected officials to, you know, pass legislation that can move the needle, but what we're seeing now is a lot of um, uh, lack of faith in our courts. We're seeing a lot of the Supreme Court justices getting involved with a lot of shady, you know, backroom dealings or getting money. How? What can we do as voters push to push our elected officials to hold our justices accountable? Because we can pass all this legislation, but if we have a Supreme Court that won't uphold it or they overturn it because they're in the pockets of, you know, these organizations, what can we do? 
Yeah, I, I just, I, I didn't even read the full article, um, but I saw that the headline in the first two paragraphs on John Roberts' spouse um, receiving all this money from, I think it was firms for uh, placement that have business before the, the Supreme Court. We know about Ginny Thomas's, um, I mean, we don't have enough time to talk about everything she's done from her participation in January 6, 2021, to the Thomas's um, receiving um, really a wonderful deal from Harlan Crow, uh, one of my fellow, fellow Texans on vacations, on buying of properties. None of this stuff disclosed to all of us, right? And we may disagree with the decisions that the court makes, that's one thing, but if we cannot trust their, their motivation, if we don't have transparency in their actions and those who have access to them, then we have another strike against this great democracy. And as you know, the, the one institution in our system of checks and balances that can hold them to account is the United States Congress um, with its powers of impeachment. And as we also know, um, there's probably not the majority right now in the House to bring articles of impeachment. These elections going forward as soon as 2024 matter so much. There's an opportunity to regain a majority that believes in democracy. And then we got to hold them accountable for actually doing it this time. They failed us in 2020 and 2021. Um, we need people in the United States Senate who take that responsibility seriously as well. Because again, the, the pernicious impact or effect or consequence of all this is it begins to erode confidence and trust in these institutions. And more and more people start to drop out and just think this, this institution, these people do not serve me. I don't have access or the money to play, and so I'm just gonna go about my life without being involved. In a real democracy, there are no sidelines. All of us are actors. All of us are expected to take action. Right now, um, we're really on the precipice of whether that's going to continue going forward. So I'm, I'm as dismayed as you are by the news. We've gotta win some elections going forward so that we have the accountability necessary. Thanks for asking. All right. This will be our final question of the evening, right over here. Hi, my name is Sarah. I hate to end on a, a failure, but I'm hoping we can learn from one of yours. Because uh, within our own, not anything specific, I'm hoping you're off, offering one up. Uh, within our own communities and spheres of influence, we're usually looking to leaders like you to help explain how you get past the same barriers where we all seem to believe in a lot of the same things, but it's about convincing other people to join us. So we often hear about the ways that worked, the things that were successful. I wonder if you can offer up a policy, a strategy, an approach that you had that you can now look back on and say that was wrong or that failed, and it influenced how you're gonna move forward differently. Maybe we can learn from that. Yeah, thank you. It's so much to choose from here. Um, so um, one that stands out is the 2018 election for Senate in Texas. You know, at the start of that, I was a member of Congress, absolutely unknown to the rest of the state outside of my district in, in El Paso. And in the wake of Donald Trump's election, and I think an understanding that maybe all of us in this room had about where this country was headed, uh, Amy, my wife, and I, almost immediately that night of the election said, we, we've got to do something different. What, what we are doing right now, serving in Congress, doing our best in these other capacities, clearly is insufficient if this just happened. We started to talk about running for Senate. And um, we, we decided to do it, and we ended up making a virtue of necessity and not having any money, um, not having any name ID, as the term goes in politics. And we just traveled the state. And I had the freedom of low expectations, no expectations, frankly. And there was no consultant worth their salt who would talk to me. I mean, I probably wouldn't have hired one anyhow, but you know, the only infrastructure of our campaign was our family, our friends, the people who'd been with us all along. And I just said what I thought, and I spoke freely and like a human being with others in every single one of those 254 counties of Texas. And as I mentioned earlier, it was really, really powerful. I mean, accidentally and, and by necessity, but really, really powerful in bringing people in visiting with young people and seeing young voter turnout up 516% from the previous midterm election. Half a million Republicans voted for Greg Abbott for governor that year and voted for me for senator, split their ticket 500,000 times 
in the state. And yet, at the end of the day, we didn't win. We didn't beat Ted Cruz. What could we have done differently? That was a winnable race. Here's, here's a mistake I made. While going to these very red and often coincidentally very rural places, uh, making the case for what I thought I might be able to do in the Senate, the bridges that I wanted to build, the common ground that I could see in front of us, never really made the case about how dangerous Ted Cruz was. I felt like, love him or hate him, you've formed your opinion and there's precious little that I can add to that. Um, let's focus on the future and what we are going to do together. Again, it brought a lot of people in. Um, it gave a lot of Republicans permission to vote for me. But without people who don't have the luxury of following the news, who might not even known that Ted Cruz was their senator, who aren't as disgusted by him as perhaps you are, and I, I certainly am, I needed to tell them the consequence of that guy being in office. And I remember very bright people calling me and saying, hey, love your positive campaign, Beto, love what you're doing, the bridges you're building, but you gotta attack this guy. Uh, he, he's really bad and not enough people in Texas know that. And I really wish I had taken that advice. I really think I would have won that race if more Texans understood. You know, at that time, he had not helped lead the insurrection that he did in 2000. In 21, but he had shut down the federal government for months. Veterans in our communities across the state of Texas unable to get into the VA. People killed in Afghanistan whose burials were held up because the Department of Defense could not process that or help their families or fly them out to where their sons were being flown in to the United States of America. That was Ted Cruz. And I also think it's incredibly important that we have the courage of our convictions always and speak honestly and truthfully about the things that matter most. I think I did that actually throughout most uh, of that campaign. I wish I just had done it even more vigorously than I did. I wish I'd done it even more vigorously than I did in 2022 where we made a withering case about Greg Abbott and the cost and consequence of that guy being in office. But you know, standing up for what you really believe in, speaking plainly, describing the threat that the other side poses. And it doesn't have to be hyperbole. It doesn't have to be the sky is falling. I mean, there's enough truth out there about what the other side represents that we don't need to make things up. I think with a much sharper campaign in 2018, we would have won that. I would be speaking to you right now as a junior senator from the state of Texas. But, but let me close with this. I've had successes um, running for and, and serving in Congress, uh, running a group called Powered by People in Texas that's registered more than 200,000 of our fellow citizens to vote. Um, obviously, our success with our family and our friends. I, I've been very, very, very lucky in life. But even these failures of losing these political contests, when I put it within the context of this larger fight and the place where that fight is taking place, the most democracy compromised place in America today, the state of Texas, I feel really good about what I'm doing. And the more I remove my ego and myself from the equation, the more I think about people like Lawrence Nixon, who did this for 21 years with zero fanfare and no recognition, and yet won perhaps the most important victory in Texas history, then it's very easy for me to stay in this fight in whatever capacity whatever role, um, whatever way makes the most sense for my fellow Texans and my fellow Americans. And so I'm gonna continue to do that and learn from every one of these defeats and make sure that we apply those lessons to the work ahead. So thanks for the great question and thank you all for coming out today. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much.